All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the second webinar from the Learning Extension Action Program. I'm uh, very excited today to have uh, Femke Lotens doing the webinar. Femke is the Green Office Coordinator for the Netherlands and uh, Belgium and wrote her thesis on student empowerment and will therefore also yeah, do the webinar today on, on this uh, very nice topic. Just uh, quick uh, points of information. We are recording uh, this webinar and we'll, uh, we'll put it on YouTube after. So just so you know if you want to ask any questions uh, later on that that will be uh, put online. And yeah, and then I, I muted you now all uh, for, for now throughout the time that, that Femke is presenting and then un unmute you uh, once uh, we have the Q&A where you can then uh, ask questions. You can also ask questions using the chat window, whichever you prefer. Uh, yeah, so then I think that's, that's mostly it. And I'll hand over to, to Femke. Hi, everyone. I will share my webcam, I think. Before I start, maybe it's nice to see you. And uh, I want to say that once I started my slides, I cannot uh, see the screen of the webinar anymore. But Andalm is there, so if you have very urgent questions or if you don't understand something, you can always ask in the chat. And then Andalm can warn me uh, that I have to reply during the slides. But I can, of course, also answer all the questions afterwards. Um, so yeah, that's it. And I will start presentation. It's the first time that I do this, so I hope everything will go fine. Um, to become the presenter. Yes. All right. Can you see my slides? I have to. Can you see my screen? Can you see, see the screen, but maybe you can put it uh, full screen. If it's... Yeah. Well, I'll put it full screen. Perfect. All right. There we go. Um, so, Rootability asked me to give this webinar because I wrote my thesis on student empowerment for sustainability. Um, and I know that uh, in the description was student and staff empowerment. But so I, I wrote it specifically on student empowerment, although the general concept of empowerment and the components also apply to staff members. Um, so I will go through the slides. It will take about 30 minutes. And then there's time for questions. And as I said, if there's something urgent, you can always tell in the chat. Um, so what I will tell you is first a kind of general introduction to environment for sustainability, the concept, what it exactly is, what it's about. Then I will explain a bit more about my thesis, uh, what I did, what was the research question, and then come more the results and how to apply it on the Green Office context about environment process. Uh, and environment outcomes and environmental impact. So these are the three big elements uh, that I hope you will take away from this presentation. So um, the purpose of, the, of this uh, overview is that you will get a general sense of the concept of empowerment and uh, to provide you with tools. Okay. So, you cannot really see it, the slides? It's it's okay, but if you could make them a bit bigger, like it's this kind of vertical... Because for me, they're full screen on the... Uh, no, it's just showing us... Yeah, that's better. This is better, but then you still see the... Again. So now it's full screen? It's fine like this. Yeah, like now? Or is it again? 
I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so where was I? Oh yeah, so give a general sense of the concept of empowerment and to provide you tools to really apply these concepts and the things that I learned in my thesis in your in office. Um, so let's start with empowerment. There are like hundreds and hundreds of definitions of empowerment and um, the concept comes actually from um, minority studies like uh, women, gender or racial that people kind of gain control over their lives and gain power to make a change. Um, but in our case it's it's similar but it's about sustainability so it's about something which is outside yourself. So this is quite different from the traditional empowerment studies. So the definition that I used in my thesis was an increase in transformational capacity of individuals or groups to achieve their own meaningful goals. And I know this is all very theoretical, but it's useful to have this concept in mind when you talk about empowerment. Um, I want to add to that that empowerment is both uh, self-empowerment, so I can be empowered to um, achieve a change, so the increasing transform transformational capacity. Um, but empowerment is also external factors or organizations or people that are like supporting the empowerment process of other people. Um, and then we have empowerment for sustainability. And I want to situate it especially in the university contexts. I read a lot of articles about engaging students, engaging people, but mostly it's about uh, education for sustainable development, so teaching the students about all the problems, about all the challenges, about how to solve it. Or it's uh, more about the campus, and about how to change the behavior of the students or the staff members. Um, so this is different from empowerment, because in empowerment for sustainability or sustainability in higher education, students actually not only change their own behavior or get more aware, but they really try to change the structures of the university in order to make them more sustainable. Um, and this is also important to have in your head, like, okay, we need, I don't say that it's not important to have the education or not important to have the uh, awareness raising and pro-environmental behavior campaigns, uh, but it's just something different and you need all three um, to truly engage everyone, I think. Um, so then from the theoretical background to my thesis, the main question was how do green offices empower students for sustainability in higher education? And okay, so get a message from Anselm. So I'm now in Can you still just see slide three? The purpose? Is that so? Uh, slide six. Um, is it still in slide three? I can do it like this otherwise. That's fine, it's on six. Six, okay, then I leave it like this, maybe that works better. Okay, <laughs> technical issues. Um, so this is a research question. Then we have the three cases that I did. So I researched uh, the Green Office Wageningen, the Green Office of Maastricht and the Green Office of Utrecht. Um, and this is like how I structured my results. I did uh, interviews and observations. Um, and I divided the results in empowerment process, empowerment outcomes and environmental impact. So um, the empowerment process is really about this increase in transformational capacity, um, 
of individuals and groups. So I, I described like how this happens for every person, like how was it individually, like the self-empowerment. And then I looked at activities that the Green Offices did to match this empowerment. And I will explain more later what, what these activities are that the Green Offices can do to support the empowerment process. Um, then I looked at outcomes, and the outcomes are twofold. The first is the empowerment itself, so people feel more capable of making a change, and uh, they changed themselves. And then the second outcome is a change in the structures of the university. Um, and then this change in structures and also the self-empowerment can, in the end, lead to environmental impact. And only if it leads to environmental impact is empowerment for sustainability. Um, because you can have empowerment and you can have that people are satisfied with what they did, but when it can still not really lead or to big or small environmental impact. Um, so that's an important extra dimension, which is only at environment or sustainability. So then um, I will explain a bit more about the process. I have like four slides on it. Um, one of the group empowerment components is community building which means that you're working together with other actors towards a common goal, uh, which is in the case of the Green Office, can be a lot of organizations, student sustainability initiatives, student organizations, staff, external stakeholders, and many more. I should have put three dots uh, as well. Um, but it might help to kind of map, like you do a stakeholder mapping of your university. and um, you look at what their goals are, and then you see how you can match the goals of these organizations with your own goals to increase collective impact. So that's uh, like the bottom, like the community building. And then uh, the next two slides, I will explain a bit more about the uh, volunteer or membership structure of the Green Office Utrecht, um, because they have one of the best empowering environments of the three cases. Um, it's similar to the to the one of the Green Office View. Actually, the Green Office Utrecht took it from the Green Office View, but since I um, looked at Utrecht, I took it from them. So uh, here are the three pillars, recruitment and selection, support and inform and appreciate. So first, very important is to make sure that people that want to be engaged with sustainability know uh, the way to your green office or know that it exists, but also know like, okay, I can actually also become involved with them and do something. So in the Green Office Utrecht, they very clearly indicated on the website how, uh, how to get involved and what, what you can expect yourself, what you can do, how to reach them. So that really helps. Um, you can also just pass by the office. It also really helps. They have the green drinks in the start of the academic year, where uh, this is also kind of recru recruitment event of new volunteers. Uh, and of course, social media and peer-to-peer -peer is also important. Uh, but you cannot really do that at the green office, but it's that other volunteers like ask their classmates or other friends to join because they like it. Um, then they do interviews with all the people that want to be engaged to see like, okay, where do you fit in our organization or what do you expect, what do you want to do, uh, what is your kind of goal, what do you want to reach. And then they have the membership contract which is also really good because uh, in there it's not binding, um, but it gives a kind of sense of what the Green Office expects from the members and what the member can expect from the Green Office. Uh, and this helps to have more like continuity uh, and less people drop out because of expectations that are not met or the other way around. Then. Uh, 
uh, support and inform. Um, you can support them in many ways. Um, in Utrecht, they have a volunteer and project coordinator, and his, his only task is actually to support, and also, like, the, his only task is to to enhance the volunteer working and empowerment of the people. Um, so he's always there if they have questions. He helps them with um, reservations, resources, information about university. Um, and they also gave one or two, and they're planning to give more workshops. So if the group needs to know more about time management, project management, or even a workshop on sustainability knowledge, uh, whatever they are missing and needing, and uh, they try to provide it. Um, and then lastly, also very important, is to appreciate your members or volunteers. Um, they have a public thank you in the end, like a big event where they say thank you to everyone. They have awards, some presents, uh, they have the certificates. And what I find also uh, nice is that they have the reference letter on LinkedIn. Uh, and they do it in a very smart way. They just ask the people that are in a project group or in a committee that they write a reference letter for each other, like in a circle. Um, so everyone writes for someone else, and then everyone has one, and then the Green Office publishes it on LinkedIn, and everyone has like a nice letter. Um, so this is the general structure. And then now I want to show you how it is organized. Um, they have officers, committees, and projects. People, so people that can, not the student employees, but people that want to be involved with the Green Office can be in one of these three. And the officers are like single persons that are helping one of the student employees. So you have the living lab coordinator, and there's one living lab officer who is helping this person, and it's on a regular basis. If, I, if I'm not wrong, it's like six hours per week, so it's fixed. Um, and for the campaign coordinator, the same. So it's like a team then of two people, which one is a volunteer and one is the, um, one is the coordinator, the student employee. Then you have the committees, which is a similar structure, so it's also student employee surrounded by volunteers. Um, so it's a team, and what is important is that it's not just the committee members that are um, that are just doing the activities that the student employee is proposing. No, they're like a team, and decide to, they decide together what they will do, how they will do it. Um, yeah, so that's important for the empowerment, that it's not just um, people being used as some free stuff. And then the last kind of uh, form, which is very interesting, is the project groups. And they are actually operating kind of independent from the Green Office. So in Utrecht there are three, UU Talks, UU Fairtrade and Gruntatas, and they um, just meet themselves, they uh, organize their activities themselves, and um, yeah, so the, the, the volunteer coordinator, Josep, is still supporting them where they need, but he's not deciding how they are working or what they exactly do. Um, so it's a good way as well to to make your the Green Office very okay still need time uh, but you don't have to be present there at every meeting or to think the whole time with them uh, on how they're organized. Okay so this is the introduction to the Green Office Utrecht and then uh, what I found in the Green Office of Utrecht and in the other two cases are like six uh, elements which you can do uh, as a Green Office to support the environment process. 
and the first is visibility. I already explained it before, and like what is the green of is exactly how to get involved. It's quite obvious. Uh, just knowing that you can go there. The second is volunteer support um, with social activities because social activities is also one of the reasons why people are joining um, to see their friends. To have some friends. You need to give them the resources uh, they need, maybe common space, uh, knowledge, and which gives meaning as well is like learning opportunities and career opportunities. Um, and then the third element is awareness on sustainability in higher education. Because as I will later, most activities of the volunteers were focused on um, or of the people that come to the green office and want to do something. Most of them want to work on operations or um, like awareness campaigns of their peers. So community engagement internally. And there were not really project groups on education, governance or research. Uh, and I don't know exactly where this comes from or how to solve it. Um, but I think the living labs are, are quite a good tool to maybe fill up this gap because now there is a lot of research from the living lab also on operations. Um, but you can also research topics in education governance research. But as I said, I don't entirely know how to, uh, yeah, how to solve this. Fourth element is to give legitimacy. Uh, people said that if they felt like, okay, I'm part of the green office or I have this mandate that they felt more powerful to make a change. Um, so in the membership helps for this, I think that everyone who is like surrounding the green office, like in Utrecht, they're a member of the green office and it's like kind of official, like I'm also the go. Although I'm not paid, I'm also part of it. And um, the project groups also, for them it also helped that they could like tell the university, yeah, but we're part of the green office, so we can use this money if we can use this space or we can make use of the resources. Uh, then fifth element, empowerment component, is reflexivity. And um, one part is to celebrate your achievements and to evaluate your activities, how it went, was it successful, and so on. Uh, I think most goals are doing this and also in their project groups. But the second part of this one is also to uh, reflect to assess and to evaluate on your on the environmental impact of these achievements. And um, this is a step which is often missing. Also Tim, I don't know if someone from the now was also there at the impact model that Tim explained. It's like an extra step which can be made. Um, and then the sixth element is control over organizations. So this means that you have access to decision making and that you have actually power on the organization itself, like the organizational structure and activities. And in the project groups of the Green Office Utrecht, this was good because they, they're like kind of self-governing. But there was, in none of the three Green Offices, the volunteers had like access to the decision making of the Green Office. Um, so they could not really decide anything on the bigger activities. And if this would be the case, it would help as well for the empowerment process. Um, so that was it for the empowerment process. Then we move to the outcomes. Uh, this is just like for you to know, maybe also to um, explain to your university board or to um, anyone else why it is important as well to engage the community and to empower them. So people that were involved with the Green Office mentioned like three things when I asked them like how did you change. Um, they said that their like drive to 
uh, make an impact, sustainable impact was strengthened. So they had it, of course, before they started. Um, but their experience with making a change and um, doing a project uh, became more stronger. And most of them mentioned as well that in the future they saw themselves uh, doing something with sustainability in their career or in their free time. And so that's really nice. They also mentioned that they, their confidence in making a change increased because of the trial and error and um, just seeing that you can actually achieve something. And even if things didn't work out, uh, people were still confident and, and, and mentioned like, okay, it didn't work, but then I moved to something else. And most of them also mentioned that they um, moved to bigger projects. So they started with something small and then they learned and then they it's all quite obvious, but it's still nice to make it explicit. And uh, lastly, they became more aware of the complexity of sustainability challenges as well in general, like how difficult it is in the world to solve it as in the university. Um, so there are the psychological changes and then are the structural changes. So this is the scheme of sustainability in higher education and you all know it by heart because it's like the pillars of the most green offices and yeah, governance is like in between all of this of education, research, community engagement and operations. And as I mentioned before, uh, almost all the projects from non-student employees were focused on internal community engagement or operations. Um, and yeah, so this is just an observation of the thesis. I think it would be nice to have more people working on education research and major community engagement. Um, but yeah, so how still needs to be find out. And then I'm almost finished with my slides because the last one is the environmental impact. It's a very small one because I don't know so much about it. Um, but just it's just important to have this framework in your head and before you start supporting a project group or people, assess on beforehand what the environmental impact is of this project or what they want to do, the goal they want to achieve. Um, and, and I know it's not so easy to do this, but just make a kind of estimation will already help um, to to see how you can use your resources efficiency and where to focus on. Um, assess it on beforehand. Check it throughout the process and afterwards. Don't only don't only evaluate your activities if they're successful, but also evaluate the impact you need. Um, yeah. So that's basically it. That was my presentation. Um, feel free to ask questions. I think I will make it smaller in the PowerPoint so that I can see you. Okay. All right. Yeah, you can ask questions if you just uh, click on the microphone button. You can enable uh, unmute yourself and then start speaking. And you can also turn on your webcam if you feel like it. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I got a question. Um, Tim from Rootability here. I was wondering what what is the difference uh, between the project volunteers and other independent student initiatives operating besides the Green Office? Because it seems like the project volunteers are operating quite independent of the Green Office, but they just get some support in terms of training or connecting 
but um, what makes the distinction between those um, volunteers working independently on a project and other student initiatives who are independent of the Green Office? Yeah. Well, so in Green Office Utrecht, um, they just they are just under the Green Office, and indeed the only difference is that they get support and that they are, they are part of the Green Office. Um, but as I saw in Wageningen, there are a lot of students' sustainability initi initiatives, but they are not part of the Green Office, like not officially. They also don't really get support from the Green Office. So this is the difference. And I think, I personally think it's good if the Green Office can take this kind of platform role and to to help all the other initiatives, initiatives to reach their goals towards sustainability um, because it makes makes it more easy, more efficient, bigger impact, uh, more overview. Does it answer your question? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I was just wondering kind of why, why, why do certain project groups and why should they get certain legitimacy or um, or support and trainings while other student initiatives don't get that from the Green Office? So, in Utrecht, there is no other student initiative except from Fossil Free. And Fossil Free doesn't want to be under the Green Office because they want to... And still, they're working quite often together. Um, but they don't want to be officially part of the university because they want to put pressure from outside. So this is, I think, a reason um, to not be under the Green Office, but otherwise there are none there. Okay, thanks. I've got some more questions, but if other people have questions, then maybe they can go first. I maybe also just like to ask uh, because you've been doing this for a very long time now and uh, quite in depth working uh, as a greenhouse coordinator and at the same time writing your thesis about this topic. Uh, what is like the main takeaway the thing that you would really tell anyone in a green office is like the most important thing you couldn't forget and that maybe someone also green office do do wrong in a sense that kind of a main takeaway. Yeah, so I think for me the most important is to um, really, really think about how to engage as many people as possible. And this volunteer structure really helps of the Green Office. They went from like um, maybe 10 loose volunteers to 40, 50. And the same in Amsterdam, now they have 70 volunteers. And I also think like most Green Offices put a lot of effort in awareness raising campaigns. And for me personally, I think it's important to empower people, change them, to make them aware about their computer use or about food choices. And of course, it's important, but like empowerment is one step further in this. Yeah. You, you mentioned something in, in terms of the psychological empowerment about the strengthened meaning and career or something like that. Can you say a bit more about what that meant in terms of meaning and career? Sorry, I don't hear you. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, I looked at environment components in order to see like how they express themselves and one of them was meaning so meaning is why do you do it like why do you want to be involved why do you want to make a change and uh, I saw four reasons or like for meaning and the first one is just making environmental impacts because so everyone has this kind of sense like yeah I, I like nature I like 
the earth I want I don't want it to be destroyed or I want to make a positive impact uh, and then other meanings were like learning friends and career so these were like the reasons why they wanted to engage so um, you know you also have these are kind of their needs the meaning is also part of their needs so if you want to support the empowerment process um, it helps if you can fulfill these needs so give career opportunities like the reference letter on LinkedIn or the certificate or like becoming part of a network which is more something which you don't actively have to do sharing vacancies was also something the Green Office Utrecht did like interesting vacancies and in that way they have an extra reason to to engage it's not like most of the time it was not one of these things but like a combination of of all these meanings yeah all right thanks I have one more question why did you choose the Utrecht volunteer structure rather than the Amsterdam volunteer structure do you think that Utrecht further evolved uh, the structure from the VU Amsterdam and it became even better in some way or um, how, how do you think they differ between VU and uh, Utrecht? Yeah, so more out of practical use, I didn't, uh, I didn't research Amsterdam because I took the three oldest green offices and since Amsterdam is quite young, I didn't um, and I did just three case studies, I took Utrecht. So it's not because Utrecht is better or uh, I think they're quite similar. Even Amsterdam has more people in their structure, but they also have more men hours. Yeah, so it was more prag pragmatic uh, than content wise. Okay. And I so Saskia asked a question here, how binding are the membership contracts? Yeah, so they're non-binding. They're non-binding. It's just like they call it an an honors an honors contract. And um it's it's really like also last week we had a workshop on volunteer management here in Wageningen. And it's part be, like you do it because you want to make clear what you expect from the volunteer and what the volunteer can expect from you so it looks kind of like a vacancy but we can also we can send the volunteer contracts of Utrecht together with the slides maybe it's useful um, but this is like the reason why you do it so you sit together and you say okay you we want you to regularly every month be involved or you are now in this project group so we let you do this, uh, but like it's yours. And of course, if they then drop out, that's 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 their own choice. But it helps to, yeah, to say on beforehand. And and that's the difference with the loose volunteers. Like people are committed for a regular time, uh, for bigger tasks than just moving furniture on a market. And they like it also way more because they produce something and they really see like, okay, I organized this movie evening and actually I did it. I, I arranged this, I arranged this, I arranged this and now all these people are here. Wow, I did it. This is empowerment. So, actually, I don't, actually, I don't think so, but they have the talk, so I think the membership contract is quite fixed. I'm not so sure about it actually, but they also have a talk about with the volunteer, like where, what do you want to work on, what is your favorite topic, how do you see yourself, how many time do you have, um, and then they sign the contract, but then they also know like, okay, this is kind of what I will do the next year or the next half year. Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, so if it's a threshold. So actually, so what I saw, Amsterdam and Utrecht, 
the amount of volunteers was like woo, getting super high. Um, yeah, so but it's part of the new like Maastricht. They're now starting to to implement this structure, um, and you have to do it like this from the beginning. So you 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 do kind of an event or. Um, you say like, okay, we want volunteers, but we want them to be committed for a longer time, or um, you get ownership yourself on a project or on a activity, and maybe it takes like half a year or a year before it's entirely set up, but in the two examples, it really worked. Even in Amsterdam, they now have too many volunteers. They cannot, they have kind of a waiting list. Um, so yeah, it's it's really successful. It's a big difference. In Utrecht also they went from ten volunteers to forty fifty. So I would say yes. <laughs> hey it's Felix. Um I have another question. First of all, thanks a lot for the presentation. I was wondering do you think there is generally a stronger culture of student engagement and volunteering in Utrecht and in Amsterdam compared to other universities? Um, do you think that might play a role where they also have so many volunteers running around? That's a difficult one. I think, of course, like every green office is, like, I can imagine that in Amsterdam there's a lot of focus also on career building and this is kind of a career building thing. But like in Wageningen, actually there are many, many people, many more than in, than in Amsterdam being involved with sustainability, but they're just involved in one of these 15 other sustainability initiatives which are not under the green office. Which is not bad because still people are being engaged with sustainability. Uh, but so it's even more than in Amsterdam. So I think everywhere there is kind of this potential. Um, but just looking at the websites, also in Wageningen there's not an indication on the website that you can actually get involved with the Green Office. So if people don't even know this, um, I don't know how it is with your Green Office, Esther and Saskia, like can people easily find it? Uh, or know like okay I want to be I want to do something uh, can I write an email or how how is it at this moment um, hi uh, it's Esther and here in uh, Hildesheim we basically we have the problem that that we have um, several different campus like we have um, like it's not um, we are based uh, at the Haupt campus, uh, so at the ma main building, but not um, they are not that much connected, and um, that's one of the problems that we are working with right now. Actually, uh, the, the information, for example, on the website, um, you can find it and everything, and we try to become more present, but that's also one of, one of the thresholds, and um, we also found that a lot of people, they don't identify as much with the, um, with the university, um, some of the students even, like, they don't even live in Hildesheim. I mean, it's much different in Amsterdam, I guess. And, yeah, and that's, I guess that's also a bigger problem. Um, but um, I also have a question. Maybe um, one of the other German universities can, if there are more German universities uh, around, uh, uh, can say something about um, the, yeah, maybe there's, there's a comparison because maybe there's a, just a, a different culture of, of, in, of getting engaged in the Netherlands than there is in Germany. I was wondering about that. Maybe somebody can contribute. Well, there are a lot of Germans. <laughs> I, I don't think we have uh, other German green offices here, but maybe Tim or Felix can say something about this. I can give it a try. Um, so it's a it's a good question. Generally, I think it's let's say there's so far one green office at TU Kaiserslautern, their Nachhaltigkeitsbüro. 
they adapted the structure also from the, the VU. Um, and I also sent Simon, who's working in your green office, their presentation to their supervisory board, which indicates a bit how they have their structure done. Um, they call it Mitwirkende instead of members or volunteers. I think it's a fun German name to use. Um, generally, I think could could be a cultural difference, but I think most has to do a lot with um, the identification of students with the university. Then if, they, if there's a campus university or not. Um, so that's a huge, huge thing and definitely Utrecht and Amsterdam, they're both, and also Wageningen, they're both uh, campus universities, whereas also there are other universities in the Netherlands that are a bit more spread out. Um, and then generally how much the university cares about students and how many other opportunities there are for student engagement. And I think there's generally a difference between German universities, Dutch universities, and British universities. So British universities have a very strong culture of in engaging students. Um, they even have funds for student projects. It's quite amazing. In the Netherlands, this is now a bit coming more strongly. And then in, in Germany, I don't think there's this culture so much. A lot happens through the independent student organizations like the ASTA and the STUPA. So I think most engagement happens through them. And then you have all these independent student groups. But there's generally less engagement from the side of the university for students through extracurricular activities. So I think the Green Office can there play especially a very strong role to start to, to build that. So I just want to add, like indeed one of the other environment components is like collective belonging. So it's having a feeling of belonging to the Green Office or to the university or both. Um, and what helps is just all the other stuff, like having social activities, having a nice office where they can have access to. And I was also involved in Ghent in a, the, like, not the Green Office, but like Student Sustainability Initiative. And also there, a lot of people were involved, but because we also did nice things. We went out on a weekend, we uh, had dinners together, we had parties together. Um, yeah, so this really helps. And this was also a, a campus which is scattered. There was not even a physical place. There was not a physical office. But uh, yeah, we were all part of Ugentin Teen. And, and yeah. And in Belgium it's also less strong than in the Netherlands. The community, like the being involved in study associations. Um, but it's an important one as well to try to to keep in mind. Uh, and then I see your questions. Uh, one social media platform for communication. More platforms on Facebook. I think most of them use Facebook. Facebook group, um, newsletters, and the website. And maybe they also use Twitter, but not so many people have Twitter, so I think this is not really necessary. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but other questions? Well, you mentioned the environmental impact, and I was just wondering if you had some, um, if there was some sort of monitoring assessment or evaluation of, of the impacts, and in also why, in, in your cases, yeah. And, and the I second know. question is also to what extent, and why you only focus on the environmental impact and not also on the social or economic. Oh yeah, it could be, it could be all three. But actually, most green offices, or the ones that I researched, uh, often they say, like, okay, we do people, planet, profits. But then if you look at the activities, they focus themselves more on ecological impacts. Um, but it's true, actually, it should include also social social issues. Economic, economic is a bit more difficult, I don't know, to include. Yeah, economic impact. Um, 
But what was ah yeah, so if I did the uh, impact assessment of the so I listed all the projects of the there was one project group in Wageningen and there were three or four in Wien Office Utrecht. I could actually not assess the impact because it was all like kind of awareness raising. Uh, so I listed the outcomes and some things were changed. Um, like in in widening aware some policy changes, um, but I, I I didn't have the means to ask myself what the impact was. But I think it's just important. An important result of my thesis is that the green offices should assess the impact. If you understand what I mean. But yeah, there was okay. also my question: not so much of you assess their impact, but if that's something they do themselves, if they are already collecting data. They don't or do it. No, they don't do it. Not at all. I asked Utrecht, and they they even said uh, um, ah, we never thought of them. But I also think it's important to give them the tools or. I I also don't know like how to okay you can do life cycle assessment and stuff on your phone but impact evaluation they mentioned that they don't have so much knowledge on it and that they know they should do it more often like in my um, but that they didn't do it and I think Maastricht was most advanced in impact evaluation. But they didn't have the project groups yet, so I didn't really. I only looked at. I didn't look at all the activities of the green office, but at the activities done by the volunteers. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Hemke. Uh, it's a really great uh, webinar, and uh, yeah, we have the next one on the fifteenth of June, and yeah, the video and materials will of course be be sent around as well. Thank you. <laughs> I'm done for assisting. <laughs>